This channel is part of the History Hit Network. The world is changed forever by a new technology, nuclear. Two superpowers dominate the world, each facing the other in a state of neither war nor peace. This is the story of the Cold War, how the push of one button could lead to total global destruction. Together we shall save our planet, or together we shall perish in its flames. How the struggle between two political systems caused millions to suffer. Spy was very much part of the Cold War. and how a world was created which lived in constant fear. Mad World, Mutually Assured Destruction. In this episode, revolution flares up on both sides of the Atlantic. He established a communist satellite right on the doorstep of the United States. There was a sense of excitement, a sense that there was something really important happening. Revolutionaries refused to surrender, so they went in and, uh, and crushed it. Leaving their parents, these two little boys reached the Austrian border, alone and hostile. The Soviet Union leaps ahead in the arms race. Then round and round the globe, leap leaping to Moscow and the world. Awesome capabilities. But then you realize their purpose is destruction. And Western Europe prepares for nuclear war. You prepare for the worst and hope for the best. The US and USSR rely on friendly countries for security. The North Atlantic Treaty Alliance, NATO, obliges the USA and Western Europe to fight to protect every country in the alliance. As the Cold War becomes restless, NATO becomes more than a treaty. I believe, first, the preservation of free America requires our participation in the defense of Western Europe. British airborne forces provided the spearhead of the attack in Operation Brown Jug, the biggest exercise yet carried out in Denmark by combined NATO forces. U.S. military units are moved to the front line, the border between Western and Eastern Europe. They learn to work as a team with the Europeans in regular NATO maneuvers. Off the southern shores of Sardinia, British, Italian, and American forces take part in a combined assault exercise. This particular phase involved Royal Marines and US Marines, and quite a tough business too. What a way to come ashore. Now the Admiral tries it. No comment. It was a good deal if you work with NATO, because NATO headquarters celebrated all NATO holidays and all U.S. holidays. So it seemed like they were always on vacation. I'm joking, of course. If you love history, then you will love History Hit. Our extensive library of documentary features everything from the ancient origins of our earliest ancestors to the daring mission to sink the Bismarck. History Hit has hundreds of exclusive documentaries with unrivaled access to the world's best historians. We're committed to bringing history fans award-winning documentaries and podcasts that you cannot find anywhere else. Sign up now for a free trial and Timeline fans get 50% off their first three months. Just be sure to use the code TIMELINE at checkout. NATO bases in Western Europe are supplied with American bombs. The possibility of a nuclear strike is real. OK, yes, I was stationed at Royal Air Force Wildenrat, which was uh, a well-equipped station built after World War II, specifically for NATO. There was a top-secret room which had all the maps available of targets we might be uh, required to hit. I flew an aircraft called the Canberra BI-8. 
The aircraft, first of all, were wired for nuclear weapons, and we didn't have them. Each crew was allocated a target. The plan was to fly as high as possible for the first bit, and on reaching the edge of the Soviet radar at about 450 knots, and at a pre-calculated point, we'd pull up into a 3G half loop, and at 45 degrees, release the weapon, which again is done automatically. The aircraft would continue on a half loop to about 30 degrees below the horizon, upside down, and then turn the right way up, dive as fast as possible to the ground, and try and beat the fireball back to safety. We had no illusions. There'd probably not be any coming back because the Soviets would not sit there and wait for us to bomb their airfields. They would do the same to us. And we felt that if the worst came to the worst, we would do our job. By the mid-1950s, US armed forces are stationed in bases from the UK to France, Belgium, and Germany. All are on 24-hour standby to protect the West from a Soviet invasion. We had nuclear weapons pre-positioned in Europe, and that was common knowledge. They were there to be used if it was, became necessary. Even down when I was uh, commissioned as a lieutenant in my battalion, which is about 800 people, we had the Davy Crockett, which was a tactical nuclear weapon. Well, it's just a prudent thing and a responsible thing to do. You prepare for the worst and hope for the best. As the fear of global annihilation grows, so does the scale and range of the planes designed to drop the bomb. The Americans are also considering expanding aviation production with priority for long-range bombers. Work on the Boeing Stratofortress B-52 is in full swing. The B-52 is huge. Powered by eight jet engines, it can carry 35 tons of weaponry. Taking off from California, three nuclear B-52 jet bombers begin their non-stop flight around the world. The giant planes have their tanks replenished several times while in the air. They've got a range of 6,000 miles without refueling. With 24 jet engines roaring in unison, the three planes are averaging over 500 miles an hour. 24,325 miles in a non-stop time of 45 hours and 19 minutes. A world record. Eisenhower steps up U.S. spending on defense to $24.2 billion. The B-52 should make any aggressor think twice before making trouble. October. 1956. The standoff between East and West is about to be put to the test. Eight Eastern European countries are under Soviet domination. One of those countries has had enough. I had no idea, no inkling of the fact that this was going to happen. Hungary decides to take a stand. Hungarians began heroic bid for freedom with a fight for life against red oppression. And the security police shot into the crowd and killed somebody. Up until then, it was a peaceful demonstration. But when that happened, it became a violent revolution. Scenes filmed during the Battle of Budapest show patriots fighting street by street in a desperate effort to win back their liberty at last. the battle-torn avenues, derelict tanks bore witness to the fury of the battle. Some 8,000 people are believed to have lost their lives in the face of Soviet tanks and artillery. The 
Hungarians take revenge on their oppressors. In the bitter conflict, the secret police were routed and their headquarters ransacked. Communist books and leaflets were burnt in the streets as a triumphant gesture by those who had suffered an iron shard oppression. At the end of a six-day fight that astonished the world and shook the Kremlin to its foundations, Hungary was free. The Hungarian uprising is a moment of optimism in a world in fear of Russian domination. The Hungarian revolution that was widely described in the Soviet press and it was portrayed, of course, as this attempt to subvert the uh, socialist life. It seems as though the underdogs have won. A nation of 10 million people has broken free from its massive neighbor in the East. But the party is short, and the fight for freedom is not over. Then word came that Russian forces were massing, and all communication with the West was cut off. And what happened when the Soviet tanks were sent in? They surrounded the city, and they gave an ultimatum to the revolutionaries to surrender. All these hundreds, maybe thousands of tanks, which encircled the, the city, were parked outside our apartment block. But the revolutionaries refused to surrender, so they went in and, uh, and crushed it. Rumors flared of the re-entry of Russian forces and new fighting. The beautiful city of Budapest, scarred by conflict, again faces a Russian onslaught, even before the debris of the fight for freedom is cleared from the streets. Now to Via, where the broadcast from Budapest was picked up and recorded during the confused situation in Hungary. A voice giving the news, followed by the sound of fighting. <laughs> Many Hungarians are convinced Western nations will join their fight against the Russians. Well, they were very hopeful about intervention by the West and, and particularly the United States. I mean, we listened to a radio station called Free Europe, which was broadcast out of Germany, and it was financed by the CIA. So that was a propaganda station. And my parents and I, we, we listened to that all the time, and they were urging us egging us, egging the, uh, the Hungarians on to fight and to resist, and we will come and help you. But they never did. This time, the Russians are uncompromising. The only help offered by the West is through the Red Cross. Casualties, as everyone knows, have been heavy. And many countries, including Britain, are sending help for the wounded. Protests erupt around the globe, on the streets of New York, in front of the United Nations. No military aid is offered despite emphatic speeches at NATO. In retrospect, I understand why. I mean. You know, the reality was that the Americans didn't want to risk uh, a nuclear war by uh, going to war with the Soviet Union. And the events of recent weeks in Hungary have shown conclusively that the Soviet Union will not hesitate to use force to suppress human freedom. My father was active during the events and there would have been retribution uh, had we stayed after the revolution. That must have been the moment when my parents decided that it's time to flee. The only hope for many is to get out as quickly as possible. In the panic, homes are abandoned and families become separated. Leaving their parents, these two little boys reached the Austrian border, alone and half-starved. My mother woke us up. 
the three kids and said, get dressed, we're going. I said, well, going where? It's three o'clock in the morning, where, where are we going? And she said, never mind that, just get dressed. So we got dressed, uh, left everything, and then we got on a train uh, heading down to the Austrian border. The flight to Austria and freedom becomes a steady flow. The refugees had to dodge Russian troops who were patrolling the canal. In the tall reeds of the marshland, the Hungarians hide until it seems to be all clear. And then, in little exhausted groups, they stumble across. Sometimes friendly Austrian frontier guards are on the lookout to guide the Hungarians to the best crossing place. The Hungarian people who helped refugees to safety were shot if caught. That night, Julius took us across the border and he held my hand and my little brother's hand and following us were my older brother and my parents. And he took us across this field of corn. We walked very quietly, nobody spoke. The only noise that I could hear or remember was the squeaky noise of the shoes in the light snow. And as the Russians close in, attempts to escape get more desperate. And even after the Russians smashed up the bridge, refugees continued to get across, clambering over the wreckage. They form a human chain to carry a baby to safety. The Hungarian people are once more prisoners in their own country. As night descends on liberty behind the Iron Curtain, a ring of red tanks blocks the last road to safety. As communist ideology tightens its grip in Europe, it's about to strike a killer blow across the Atlantic. In the new city of Havana, you see evidence of an ingenious talent in architecture. Cuba's capital is booming with lavish bars, casinos, and beach clubs. They've given the tropics a new temple, a blood-stirring Latin rhythm which sets the feet to dancing and the heart to pounding. Havana in the 50s was one of the great party cities of the Americas and uh, it was a very lively and, and very wealthy uh, city as well. It attracted tourists not just from the US but right around the world. By the 1950s, Havana is earning more revenue than Las Vegas. Movie stars, models and millionaires come to play. But there is a dark secret. The Batista regime was corrupt. To some extent, it wasn't all that different to what was going on in many other places in Latin America. Bags of cash are collected from the casinos and clubs every night. And not everyone in Cuba benefits from the sparkling city. The real backbone of the country, the great seas of flowing sugarcane, still harvested by machetes and loaded by hand on primitive box carts. It's hard, backbreaking work that is mechanized in most other countries, but not in Cuba. A lot of uh, peasants in Cuba who wear sugarcane cutters had a very tough time because sugar gets cut in a very small period of time, a few months. They would get work during that time, the rest of the time they wouldn't. So that was very, uh, very difficult, clearly. The refinery plays an almost human role in Cuban life. 
and is usually named after dear ones. Sounds funny, but you might know this industrial layout as Dolores. In the 1950s, the bulk of the sugar was sold to the U.S. Uh, there was a special agreement between Cuba and the U.S., which meant that the U.S. paid a fixed price. Sugar is Cuba's white gold, but much of the profits flow into U.S. multinationals or the pockets of President Batista. President for the first time in 1940, Batista regained the presidency in 1952. Batista uses torture and execution to silence opposition. Cuba is a police state. You had a very comfortable middle class that was continuing to grow and that wanted political change. November 1956. The heat in the Cold War is about to be turned up. A yacht named the Grandma approaches the Cuban coast. An army of revolutionaries is on board. Their leader, a young lawyer, Fidel Castro. The revolution that began with Castro, a fugitive, practically alone, landing with 82 followers, to be nearly wiped out by government forces. The Cuban Revolution nearly ends before it's begun. Castro and what remains of his rebels managed to hide in the mountains. Like most other Cuban families, my family was supportive of what Castro said he was trying to do at first. The rebel numbers increase. They strike out when they can. The forces of Castro's 26th of July movement have grown vastly, their power enlarged by captured and surrendered army weapons. World champion Juan Fangio was tipped as the winner, they said, but that was before he was kidnapped from his Havana hotel. His team members tell the police how Fangio was carried off at gunpoint by Cuban rebels who wanted to sabotage the race. He was only released after it was over. Over the next 18 months, Castro's forces gather both strength and support. A lot of the people who supported the revolution and who went up to the mountains to fight were middle class, politically aware young men and women. Peasants from those areas did join later on, but the nub of the revolution was very middle class. Then the rebel armies break out of the Sierra Maestra. Total revolution flares up. Castro met an all-out government offensive with a counterattack, and in the battle for the key rail center of Santa Clara, won the crucial victory. January 1st, 1959. President Batista flees Cuba. He takes a personal fortune of $300 million. Nearly two years of hit-and-run warfare aimed at toppling Batista's government by paralyzing Cuba's economy culminated in victory as 1958 ended. The Batista government has murdered 20,000 people in the last seven years. Havana goes wild as the news spreads that Cuba's long struggle has ended with the flight of Batista and the triumph for Fidel Castro. At first, the celebration was peaceful as shouting, cheering crowds surged through the city. Then the temper of the throng changed and an ugly mob reigned the streets. Prime targets, the symbols of the overthrown regime. The gambling casinos, the parking meters, the homes and businesses of Batista Strong. The news is good. Castro is on his way to Havana, and his troops will soon be here, so hurry. Now is the moment to celebrate and to get a bit of our own back. Anyone suspected of sympathy for the Batista regime came in for a rough time. Castro brings his troops 850 kilometers from Santiago de Cuba to Havana. They had marched right across the island in a triumphant progress, joyfully acclaimed all the way. In January 59, when Castro rides from one end of the island all the way to Havana, uh, there was enormous popular support for what had happened. 
in my parents' way are no different. At last, Dr. Fidel Castro himself arrived. Time and again, he was held up by the crowds. Within five weeks, Castro is sworn in as the prime minister of Cuba. He spoke to them of the new regime now being inaugurated, a regime, by the way, now formally recognized by Britain. Castro makes an impact on Cuba almost immediately. He spends money on health care, clean water, education, and housing. Showing another aspect of his character, the unpredictable Castro dons a baseball uniform to pitch a full inning in a benefit game for his agrarian land reform fund. But not everyone is happy. Hundreds of enemies are tried and executed. Castro initially made overtures to the U.S. and went to the U.S. very early in 59 and declared he was not a communist. He was a Democrat and elections would be held in Cuba. In fact, he even gave a timeline of 18 months. Well, the 18 months came and went and nothing much happened. Land is taken from private owners and given to farm workers. The sugar industry is nationalized, and the multinational companies lose their cash cow. Cuba is clearly a communist state. It is less than 200 kilometers from the USA. Relations between the two nations plummet. He achieved virtually the impossible. He established a communist satellite right on the doorstep of the United States. Since then, Castro has held the respect and adoration of his people, along with the fear and loathing of the Western powers, particularly the United States. Once in power, Castro visited the United States and was recognized as his country's head of government. The US knew Castro was plotting its downfall, and in its turn, the United States was busy plotting his death or overthrow. And uh, I'm not a complete believer in kind of American or Western innocence in every case. I think in Cuba, for example, you know, there was legitimate rejection of the old regime. President Eisenhower commands the CIA to assassinate Castro. He gives them $13 million to do the job. Fidel Castro whips up a furor in Cuba, charging the United States with arming and training mercenary forces for an imminent invasion. Tensions between the Cold War next-door neighbors builds to breakpoint. She's the French freighter La Coube, which blew up in Havana while unloading munitions. There was heavy loss of life. And when more explosions followed, the fire spread to warehouses along the dock. The actual scene of the blaze was ugly enough. But Dr. Castro, the Cuban prime minister, added fuel to the political flames by saying that sabotage caused the disaster. His implication that United States officials were responsible brought an immediate and rigorous denial and protest. These accusations shocked America almost as violently as the exploding ship rocked Havana. Such fires are not easily put out. Then, 1,400 troops make a secret landing on a beach in southern Cuba. They are Cuban exiles trained by the CIA. They are here to overthrow Castro. The invaders are defeated within four days. confusion among the relatives of the insurgents. In Miami, they besieged the headquarters of the Revolutionary Democratic Front, seeking some news of sons and brothers, with Castro claiming the capture of 500 invaders and threatening them all with the firing squad. These weeping women see no chance for their loved ones. Some of the insurgents are executed. Most are returned to the USA in exchange for food and medicine in the value of $53 million. The invasion 
is named after the landing spot chosen by the U.S. trained troops, the Bay of Pigs. The notorious Bay of Pigs invasion by exiled Cubans served only to humiliate Cuba's giant northern neighbor. The USA can't seem to win a trick. For the West, the Bay of Pigs invasion is an all-time low in the Cold War. But within a year, events in Cuba will be infinitely more chilling. It is the night of the 4th of October, 1957. Today, a new moon is in the sky, a 23-inch metal sphere placed in orbit by a Russian rocket. A three-stage rocket, number one, the booster in the class of an intercontinental missile, its weight estimated at 50 tons. The smaller second stage took over at 5,000 miles an hour and carried on to the highest point reached. 500 miles up, the artificial moon is boosted to a speed counterbalancing the pull of gravity and released. You are hearing the actual signals transmitted by the Earth-circling satellite, one of the great scientific feats of the age. I was a, a young boy with uh, Dad in Oklahoma when Sputnik was launched. And I remember looking up, and he pointed it out as it would go by in the sky. It, it was just awesome. It was mind-boggling to think that um, it was possible to place a human object in outer space. And it was a little bit scary. You know, the fact that you could place something in orbit and it wasn't us. <laughs> uh, it got people's attention. Sputnik, the world's first man-made object in space. The signal from this little shiny ball can be heard by anyone with a radio receiver. It strikes dread into the hearts of the West. Then round and round the globe at 18,000 miles an hour, bleep bleeping to Moscow and the world. Apparent proof that Russia could deliver an H-bomb at long range by rocket. The West was clearly very concerned about Sputnik. And I, this is a case where you know, the popular movies are under-dramatizing what was really going on. Uh, you had a, a major strategic event that had massive implications for national defense, national security, economic advantage. Стимулом сильнейшим для появления у нас первого спутника и причиной того, что мы оказались впереди американцев, была в том числе и атмосфера холодной войны. President Eisenhower needs to rally the confidence of his country. It is my conviction, supported by trusted scientific and military advisors, that although the Soviets are quite likely ahead in some missile and special areas, and are obviously ahead of us in satellite development, as of today, the overall military strength of the free world is distinctly greater than that of the communist country. We must see to it that whatever advantages they have are temporary only. The U.S. satellite will be launched by a Vanguard rocket. The reputation of a nation is at stake. A moment or two of high expectation after the firing button has been pressed. Is that a fuel leak there in the first section of the three-stage rocket? Disaster follows as this official film shows only too clearly.
Six weeks later, the USA is ready to try again. At Cape Canaveral, Florida, the Army's Jupiter C rocket is ready for America's second attempt to launch a space satellite. The moment is at hand, the countdown reaches zero. Some three minutes later, Explorer is in orbit. The space race between east and west is on. But no one is under any illusion that the fight to conquer space is about benevolent exploration. There is absolutely no question that the massive effort was being put in the development of strategic missiles and the weapon systems on those strategic missiles. This year's parade in Moscow's Red Square was extra special, for it marked the 40th anniversary of the October Revolution. And then came the evidence that we're now living in the rocket age. Modern weapons like this tell the story of Russia's striking power. Of all scientific advances achieved in the past year, rockets have made the greatest impact on the mind of man. Armed as these missiles can be with nuclear warheads, they point skywards with terrifying implications. 1957, the year of the rocket, has indeed brought the theory of devastating push-button warfare very close to fact. The awe and wonderment of the systems, mind-boggling. You know, I remember as a kid, Dad would take us to, probably shouldn't have, but we went on to SAC bases and I went over B-52s, we went to see missile firings in uh, strange locations. You know, you look down at ballistic missile, silo hundreds of feet in the ground and, and as a kid i mean awesome capabilities that are cause you to dream and and be excited about where technology is going but then you realize their purpose is destruction and not destruction on a on a on a manageable scale but mass destruction both sides strive to be bigger and better in this new theater of war With a weight of 8,800 pounds, the Atlas is by far the biggest satellite, more than double the mass of Russia's Sputnik 3. Soviet Russia scores a dramatic victory in the exploration of space with the launching of the first rocket to hit. This time at Cape Canaveral, a naval vanguard did the job perfectly to circle the globe at 19,000 miles an hour and join the others, getting quite crowded up there. As the space race accelerates, both sides take aim for the ultimate prize, to place a human being into orbit and bring him home. The B-52 mother plane carries aloft the X-15 rocket plane leading up to the epic mission for which it was designed, to carry a man beyond the fringes of the Earth's atmosphere and to return him to the ground. The X-15 is cut loose seven miles over the Mojave Desert to fall free and glide back to Earth. The space plane's first free flight is a success. News on developments are broadcast by both sides of the Iron Curtain. Also seen in Moscow, the press conference given by the space dogs. Strelka, Little Arrow, and Bielka, Squirrel, the white one, seem to be in excellent form. In fact, by their cheerful demeanor, they answered all questions about how they'd stood the journey. Having whizzed round the Earth 17 times, we're told, at a height of 200 miles, they were safely back with quite a story to tell, if only they could tell it. Russian scientists claim that these dogs have blazed the trail for cosmic flight by man. When the day finally comes, the world is changed forever. The Earth looked a delicate blue floating in a black sky. So said the first man in space after his fabulous journey of 108 minutes, Major Yuri Gagarin. The Gagarin trip into space was a, a tremendous kind of celebration. The Soviets were sure that we were the most advanced nation on Earth, but that confirmed it. Gagarin, of course, was this photogenic guy, really nice guy, actually. 
he was really a true national hero. With a smile that could light up the Cold War, Yuri Gagarin becomes the darling of both East and West. Major Gagarin looked as pleased to arrive in Britain as Britain was to greet him. And one of the great demonstrations that a capability had reached maturity was the ability to launch a human in space. The Soviet Union is well and truly ahead in space technology. It will take eight more years and a new president before the USA bounces back. August 1961, one Eastern Bloc country faces a crisis. Despite the Iron Curtain, East Germany has been hemorrhaging people. The flow of those seeking asylum here on the fringe of freedom has reached 1,500 a day. Three point five million East Germans have fled across the inner German border. Twenty percent of the population. And the Soviets saw all the intelligentsia and the professionals, the doctors, the lawyers, the builders, the architects, migrating to the West. The hole in the border between East and West is in one city, Berlin. The attention of an anxious world is focused on East and West Germany and Berlin. The last great exodus of refugees from the East is processed in the Marienfeld Center. Once the East Germans are processed, they are absorbed into the hungry West German labor market. Midnight, Saturday, the 4th of August, 1961. Khrushchev decides to plug the leak. East German troops swoop down on the border between Red Berlin and the Free City in the pre-dawn hours to close the 66 points where movement between the sectors has been relatively free. It was not trying to keep people out. It was trying to keep people from escaping. They were, they were losing 250,000 people a week, and that was the power drain on them. Barbed wire is rolled out across the city. By Sunday morning, Berlin has been cut in half. The border between East and West Berlin is closed. Houses in the East are demolished to create an open space along the fence. Berliners who held coveted jobs in the West were told to stay home, and the elevated trains were halted. But from now on, crossings into free Berlin will be fugitive affairs. It was very dangerous to escape from East Germany into the West, but people came up with ingenious methods of escaping inside of car fenders. People would repel from buildings. East Berliners who have apartments facing the border take the long chance when they get orders to leave their homes for the interior. While an East German guard attempts to yank her back to prison, West Berliners pull her to a fire net and freedom. Friends of an East Berliner raise a ladder from the west over the cemetery wall over the barbed wire then the signal, and the fugitive makes his daring dash up the tilted ladder. He must feel that a thousand enemy eyes are on him, a hundred guns pointed at his back. His friends watch and pray. Seconds seem like hours. He's over. One more man has slipped the red yoke. He's a 25-year-old mathematician from Cottbus who has a fiancé in West Germany, proving again that love laughs at locksmiths and border guards. Guard with East German guards, they weren't Soviet guards because the Soviets were trying to save a bit of cash and they were more vicious than the Soviets. 
the East German border guards have orders to shoot to kill. The frontier is heavily guarded now and escape is more difficult. Yet still they vote for freedom and they call it voting with their feet like this. Looks as if she's hurt herself, but no, she's all right. Over the frontier, the prison walls behind. When I moved to Berlin, I was a major in command of a special forces unit that didn't exist. It didn't really matter whether they're communist or not, but it's a totalitarian regime and they didn't want you to leave. In key areas, the fence is quickly replaced by a wall. Once they'd revealed their intention last year, the East German authorities worked feverishly night and day to complete it. Solid and apparently impregnable, concrete blocks 10 and 12 feet high, reinforced by tank traps. It stretches for 26 miles right across the city. In some places, the front of a house or block of flats is in the western sector, while the back is part of the east. The Berlin Wall is complete. Friends, families, and half a city are permanently cut off. The wall becomes a focus of conflict on the Cold War front line. For a year, the unending war of nerves has gone on. Smoke bombs and water jets from mobile water tanks have greeted those in the West who dared to come too close. The challenge we had in Berlin throughout the years was that we were surrounded by enemy. We were deep within enemy lines. We even introduced 155 howitzer artillery in Berlin, which is a nuclear capable weapon. Surprisingly, there was not a lot of objection to that. If there is a dangerous crisis in Berlin, and there is, it is because of threats against the vital interests and the deep commitments of the Western powers and the freedom of West Berlin. And it became more difficult as time went on because the wall was not static. It was constantly improved on. Every time somebody had escaped, there was an effort made to identify what the weak links were, and then measures were taken to correct it and to fortify that wall. Against all odds, the East Germans are not beaten. This is just one of many tunnels honeycombing the border between the East and Western sectors. At least 17 escapers have used this route to freedom, but hundreds have got away through similar tunnels. Horrific stories emerge as the wall stands guard. One of the most chilling concerns a 20-year-old bricklayer. The anger of the people of West Berlin has been provoked by recent actions of the communists. In particular, their cold-blooded attitude towards an East Berlin youth shot as he tried to escape across the wall. There's a river, Spree, which divides East and West as well, which is in the Soviet side of the, of the, uh, the wall. People tried to swim the spray, but there were guard towers there, and they physically shot people dead swimming in the river. Peter Fechter, who was a young student, who managed to swim the spray, was climbing over the barbed wire fence on the other side, got stuck on the fence, and they just shot him dead. Peter Fechter lies alone at the foot of the wall for over an hour before dying from his injuries. And he's left his body there for about three days. There's a little cemetery with crosses of all the people who were shot by East German guards trying to make a bid for freedom. The Cold War in Berlin is very personal. Germans escaping from Germany, families forced apart, border guards shooting their own countrymen. The tensions in Berlin could easily escalate. The president of the USA comes to make a stand. 
There are many people in the world who really don't understand or say they don't. What is the great issue between the free world and the communist world? Let them come to Berlin. Today, in the world of freedom, the proudest boast is, Ich bin ein Berliner. Despite continuing atrocities, the wall shows every sign of being a permanent feature in Berlin. The first obvious result of the building of new walls is to increase the tension. Here in Berlin, the West stands on guard facing the next move by the East in the continuing Cold War. Next time on Mad World, both sides are a breath away from turning the world into a wasteland. The purpose of these bases can be none other than to provide a nuclear strike capability against the Western Hemisphere. We all came to grips that it was truly the end of the world as we knew it. A proxy war spins out of control on the battlefield and at home. It is an orchestrated lie to make the American people hate the Vietnamese. The American troops would be impaled on those sharp bamboos in trying to avoid the dummy Viet Cong. I witnessed the, the tragedy and the waste of war as well. You don't wish it on anybody. Both superpowers make moves to strengthen their hold. For the people of Prague, it must have felt like being the nut in a nutcracker. Our two peoples tonight hold the future of the world in our hands and the USA steps foot on alien territory. Because of what you have done, the heavens have become a part of man's world.